start filming now. Okay, so um, a reminder also that the synthesis assignment, which we talked about first talked about a couple weeks ago, is due uh, a week from today. So if you have not started that assignment, you need to start that this week. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on the suitability of uh, papers or any questions you might have on syntheses that you locate. Uh, today we're going to discuss peptides. We discussed amino acids last week. Um, peptides are chains of amino acids, and we'll talk about uh, their structure, interesting peptides, and then we'll talk about how they're synthesized, uh, which relies a lot on protecting groups. So um, peptides uh, generally have anywhere from 2 to 40 amino acids in the chain. Uh, there's really no official dividing line between peptides and proteins. Proteins uh, would have more than 40. Some people would, would put 60 or 70 as the dividing line. So there's kind of a gray area uh, in the 40 to, to 70 range of amino acids that some people would call peptides, some would call proteins. Uh, but these are small to medium-sized chains of amino acids. And this figure here... Um, it, it's, it's not the best designed figure uh, because it kind of implies uh, this is how you would synthesize these compounds. Uh, as you'll see, it is not. You cannot just mix alanine and cysteine uh, and get these, uh, just these individual compounds. You have to use protecting groups. Uh, but what we want to look at here is just what's on the right side of the screen, uh, which shows you uh, dipeptides, uh, peptides, two dipeptides made up of uh, two amino acids. Uh, and the convention in terms of how we write the names of dipeptides using those three-letter amino acid abbreviations uh, is that the N-terminal amino acid is on the left. So the amino acid uh, where at the uh, end of the chain where its amine is not bonded to another amino acid. That's on the left. And then the C-terminal amino acid, the one where the carboxylic acid is not bonded to another amino acid is on the right. So this is ala cis and this is cis ala. What's the relationship between these two uh, dipeptides? Okay, they're isomers of each other, Sam. Yes, they're constitutional isomers because the atoms are bonded together in a different fashion. Okay, so <clears throat> these, these two peptides are constitutional isomers of each other. So the, um, the amide bonds that link uh, amino acids are indeed amide bonds. They're no different from other amide bonds, but they do have a special name. Amide bonds that are involved in peptides are known as peptide bonds. Okay, so, so when you hear peptide bond, it's just an amide that is linking amino acids together in a peptide chain. Uh, and back in... Uh, chapter 22, I believe it was, when we were learning uh, about carboxylic acids and their derivatives, and we talked about the uh, minor contributor that we have uh, with those compounds, uh, where the Z group, which in an amide is an amine, or a nitrogen, sorry, uh, donates electrons to the carbonyl, we end up with this uh, particular uh, minor contributor. And uh, we learned that with amides, this minor contributor uh, contributes more substantially uh, than it does with other carboxylic acid derivatives because of the lower electronegativity of nitrogen compared to uh, oxygen, which is involved in most of these types of compounds, or chlorine involved in acid chlorides. So um, because of the even though this is still a minor contributor, I would call it a substantial minor contributor. Uh, the nitrogen hybridization uh, in an amide is sp2. Okay, it is not sp3. So the, the contribution of this minor contributor causes that nitrogen to have sp2 hybridization. Okay? Uh, and then another feature we have is we have hindered rotation about the carbon-nitrogen bond. If it were a full double bond, then there would be no rotation uh, about that carbon-nitrogen bond. It is not a full double bond. It's a partial double bond. 
the bond order is actually closer to one than it is to two, uh, but it has enough double bond character that the rotation is slowed. There's a higher barrier to rotation about this bond than there would be about uh, a normal carbon-carbon sigma bond. So it's an 18 to 20 kilocalories per mole rotation barrier. So what that means uh, is that, it, well, for, for uh, comparison, uh, way back in chapter four, when we were learning about uh, alkanes uh, and uh, uh, Newman projections and confirmations, the barrier for rotation about the carbon-carbon sigma bond in ethane is three kilocalories per mole. So that rotation happens very, very rapidly at room temperature. Uh, and we said that there's about 20 kilocalories per mole of energy available at room temperature. So processes with an activation energy of 20 kilocalories per mole or less can occur at room temperature. Um, and so this is right on that, uh, right on that uh, border. Uh, so the rotation about the carbon-nitrogen bond of an amide can occur at room temperature, but it's going to be slow. Okay? Uh, and so what that means is that peptides uh, are primarily going to exist, or the peptide bond, we should say, the peptide bond is primarily going to exist in one of two conformations. Okay? Uh, so first of all, before we uh, analyze these conformations, uh, if this nitrogen is sp2 hybridized, what is the geometry at that nitrogen? It is trigonal planar. Okay? So the three groups uh, attached to that nitrogen are going to be in the same plane. Okay, uh, and because we have carbon nitrogen, uh, substantial carbon nitrogen double bond character, uh, then uh, this carbon, which is also trigonal planar, and the groups attached to that carbon are going to be in the same plane, much like if you had an alkene here. So when you're thinking of the geometry of a peptide bond, you want to look at the minor contributor because you'll have planar geometry uh, in the same fashion that you would have uh, if this were a carbon-nitrogen double bond. But because it is not a carbon-nitrogen double bond, we can have slow rotation or interconversion between two different planar conformations. Okay? Uh, so the one I've drawn for you over here, we refer to as S-trans. And we've seen this term before. We used it when we were talking about dienes and their conformations. This is another use uh, of this term. Uh, it means that this carbon-nitrogen bond is closer to a single bond than it is to a double bond, so the S is standing for single, uh, but these R groups uh, that are attached to the carbonyl carbon and the nitrogen, respectively, are trans to each other. Okay, so that's what our S trans means. Uh, and then that's going to interconvert. So there's going to be an infinite number of conformations of the peptide bond, but two low energy conformations uh, that are both planar. Uh, and we have the S trans, and then we have the S cis, where R and R prime are going to be on the same side uh, of that carbon nitrogen single bond. Okay. So which of these two conformations do you think would be lower in energy? Okay, S-trans, yes, we have those groups spread out, less steric hindrance, uh, and so S-trans is generally more stable than S-cis, okay? So we can take a look at a model here, a ball and stick model. Uh, this is a tetrapeptide. Uh, and so uh, we have the carbon nitrogen bond, we just uh, imagine that as an alkene, and so all of the atoms attached to that will be in a plane. So each of our amide bonds are going to be planar. But one thing that is important to note is that not all of the amides in a peptide have to be in the same plane with each other. We have twist between those planes, and that is due to the fact that we have tetrahedral geometry 
uh, of the alpha carbon of each amino acid. Okay, these carbons are tetrahedral. And we have free rotation about this carbon-nitrogen sigma bond. This is just a regular uh, sigma bond with a bond order of one. Uh, and then this carbon-carbon sigma bond. So the bonds to the alpha carbon of our amino acid are normal sigma bonds. Uh, and we have the tetrahedral geometry. So that tetrahedral geometry allows us to twist about these bonds. And what it means is that all of the different planes in the uh, backbone of a peptide are going to be twisted relative to each other in most cases. Okay? Uh, and so what that allows is a diversity of conformations for peptides themselves. Whereas the amide bonds are planar, the peptides themselves have a range of conformations depending on the orientation of those planes relative to each other. Uh, and the two most common conformations we'll talk about later on this week, uh, we can have a helical conformation known as an alpha helix, uh, and we can have a sheet-like conformation known as a beta sheet. Uh, there are others, uh, but those would be the two most common conformations we have. Uh, and those conformations are derived by the relative orientations of those planar amides uh, to each other. Any questions about the three-dimensional structures of peptides? Yes, please, Jeff. You can. So proline, because of the ring that it has, uh, favors S cis. And so uh, if you're going to have a, a turn or a kink in the chain, you're going to want to have S cis because if you look, if you look at the way the backbone goes here, it turns if you have S cis and it's extended if you have S trans. So indeed, the nature of the side chains, the nature of the groups around it uh, can cause certain amides to prefer S cis in a peptide. But if you're just looking at one individually, in most cases, they would prefer S trans. Okay, good question. All right, so um, let's talk about some interesting peptides. There are many, many, many interesting peptides. Um, many naturally occurring peptides function as hormones, uh, meaning that they are signaling molecules. They are released for certain reasons uh, in, in our bodies and in other living organisms, and then they uh, cause some sort of signal to be transmitted, uh, and then usually they're degraded after that. There's a lot of different hormones. Uh, one I'd like to talk about today uh, for a moment is called IGF-1. IGF-1 stands for insulin-like growth factor 1, okay? As the name suggests, it's a relative of insulin, uh, it actually has 70 amino acids, so it's kind of on that border between uh, peptides and proteins. Uh, but because it's a hormone, it's most often thought of as a, as a peptide, just a large peptide. Um, so it's a peptide with a similar structure to insulin. And as the growth factor name suggests, when it's released, it promotes growth. And so it's present most commonly in uh, uh, puberty. Um, during the, the time when uh, people are growing a lot. Uh, and it promotes anabolic growth, allowing you to build muscle mass without adding water weight. Okay, So it sounds like it might be useful for other purposes as well. Uh, now, interestingly enough, there are peptides similar to insulin-like growth factor, but not identical, uh, in deer antlers. So deer antlers are known as the fastest growing tissue in mammals, right? The, the, the rate at which deer antlers grow is faster uh, than any other sort of mammalian tissue. And so uh, some people had this idea. Uh, they were businessmen. They were, they were not chemists, uh, or, or if they were, they were ignoring some key aspects of chemistry. Uh, but they had this idea uh, that they could take an extract from deer antler spray uh, and they could market it as a way to bulk up, to build muscle mass. It's kind of a more natural way uh, of bulking up as opposed to using steroids. Okay? Uh, so there's a couple problems uh, here. Number one is that this insulin-like growth factor in deer antlers is not exactly the same as the one in humans. So there's no, 
uh, studies that have been done to see if it would actually promote anabolic growth in humans, okay? Uh, but then there's another problem. Uh, what happens to insulin? Can, can, um, so diabetics take insulin. How do they take it? Okay, they inject it. Why? It gets degraded in the stomach. We have enzymes in our stomach that are designed to uh, chop up proteins, right? When, when we eat protein, the enzymes in our stomach uh, chop up the amide bonds and the protein into the individual amino acids, and that's what our body uses for fuel. Okay, so if you ingest insulin orally, it's going to get destroyed by these enzymes called proteases. The same thing happens in the bloodstream. We have proteases in the bloodstream, but the insulin survives long enough uh, in the bloodstream to be able to get to its target. But diabetics have to in in inject insulin fairly frequently because of this degradation. There are newer drugs, newer mimics of insulin on the market that don't have to be injected as frequently. But this is a major issue here. Well, these individuals who were marketing deer antler spray were marketing it as an oral spray that the, uh, that the uh, people who took it uh, would just spray into their mouth uh, and then their muscles would magically grow, okay? Uh, so um, are there any sports fans in the class who are familiar with Ray Lewis? Okay, Ray Lewis. Okay, great. Who is Ray Lewis? He was a linebacker who played for the Baltimore Ravens. Yes. Uh, the year that they won the Super Bowl, he was injured early in the season. He tore a muscle in his chest. Uh, and he worked really, really, really hard to, to get back on the field, and he actually was able to play in the Super Bowl, defying expectations. They thought he'd be out for the season. Later on, it came out that he'd been taking deer antler spray as part of his uh, rehab process uh, to, to help those muscles uh, uh, grow back from, from being atrophied, okay? Uh, obviously, uh, uh, unfortunately, Ray Lewis probably did not study organic chemistry when he was a college student at the University of Miami, or he would have realized uh, that ingesting peptides orally is not going to do you any good uh, except for perhaps a placebo effect, okay? So one advantage of taking this class is you learn some basic principles that will hopefully help you evaluate uh, products uh, that are based on organic chemistry that may or may not be based on sound organic chemistry. So if you're taking deer antler spray, uh, that's basically a very, very expensive protein shake. It, it's not uh, uh, going to do any uh, more good for you than that, okay? So peptide hormones. Uh, some peptide hormones are modified in terms of their structures. Um, sometimes they have cross links between the side chains that end up forming rings. Uh, and here we have a couple of uh, uh, shown on the screen in terms of their uh, abbreviations, oxytocin and vasopressin. Uh, and a common way to form a ring in a peptide is to have a disulfide bond between the sulfurs of two cysteines, okay? So you see this cysteine is our N-terminal amino acid. There's no amino acid shown on the left of this cysteine. So that's what signals to us that that cysteine is the N-terminal amino acid but it's part of a ring because the sulfur in its side chain is bonded to the sulfur of another cysteine, okay? We learned uh, back in chapter nine, I think it was, that we can take thiols and oxidize them, uh, treat them with air or other oxidants, and we can form sulfur-sulfur bonds, disulfide bonds, and those are used in peptides and proteins to form rings, okay? Another interesting feature about these dipeptides as you'll see NH2 here written at the C terminus. Glycine is the C terminal amino acid. There's no amino acid listed to the right of it. Uh, but we have this NH2 here. What this means is that rather than having a free carboxylic acid at the C terminus, it has a primary amide. So we have NH2 bonded to the carboxylate or the, the carbonyl of glycine. So we have an amide at the end of the chain. So these uh, these are very similar compounds. They both uh, cause muscles to contract. Does anybody know what oxytocin does? Yes. Yes, uh, it, is, uh, it stimulates the uterus to contract. So this is released by uh, pregnant women when it's time for them to deliver their babies. Okay? So it causes the uterine muscles to contract, causing the baby to be delivered. So if you are induced, if the baby doesn't come out on its own, uh, then doctors can give you oxytocin, 
uh, or, or very close relatives of oxytocin to promote those contractions, okay? Vasopressin, uh, males have that as well as females. It, it uh, stimulates uh, the contraction of muscles around your blood vessels. It causes vasoconstriction, regulating your blood pressure. If you need higher blood pressure, uh, then this uh, vasopressin will be released. So a couple interesting things about these. This is oxytocin. This just shows you uh, another representation of it. So you can see the ring. Uh, you can see here this uh, N-terminal cysteine. Uh, and you can see the C-terminal amide that we have on glycine that we talked about earlier. Uh, and then here we have ball and stick models of these two peptides. The interesting thing we're seeing here uh, is that there's very little difference in these structures. If we, if we go back two slides, we see there's just two different amino acids. Isoleucine is changed to phenylalanine. Leucine is changed to arginine. Just those two changes. And then we look at these ball and stick models and we see that the overall three-dimensional shape is somewhat different, okay? Uh, so small differences in amino acids in terms of the side chains coming off the peptide backbone uh, can have a significant impact on the structure of a peptide, okay? All right, so um, my favorite peptide, vancomycin, uh, we've uh, studied that a little bit uh, before, especially back in chapter uh, three. Uh, vancomycin is actually known as a glycopeptide uh, because it has a carbohydrate portion. That's what the glyco part of the name comes from. Uh, and then it has a peptide portion. Uh, we'll learn about carbohydrates in our next chapter. It is believed that the role of the carbohydrate portion of vancomycin is to promote dimerization. It's been discovered that dimerization of vancomycin molecules causes them to more effectively bind their target uh, in the uh, bacterial uh, cell wall precursor. Uh, and then the peptide backbone, you take a look at this, uh, you know, we see amino acids, we see amide bonds, but we don't see a lot of amino acids that we recognize. So vancomycin is a heptapeptide, and there's only one normal amino acid. We have this asparagine right here, okay? All the other amino acids are modified. Several of them are D-amino acids, uh, this is an N-methylated uh, D-leucine. Some of them are what are known as phenylglycine. So this, if, if, if these are not phenylalanine. There's no uh, sp3 carbon between the benzene ring and the alpha carbon. So those are called phenylglycine. That's an uncommon amino acid. We have beta-hydroxy amino acids. So these are like beta-hydroxy tyrosines that also have chlorines on them all kinds of modifications. So what's the purpose of all these modifications? Well, the purpose is to get the peptide backbone in the ideal conformation for binding to that cell wall precursor. We showed you this cartoon-like figure last semester where the bacterial cell wall uh, needs to have these cross links between those peptide strands that come off of the, uh, uh, the, that cell wall precursor. Uh, and vancomycin binds to uh, a dipeptide at the end of that uh, strand, uh, preventing the enzyme from, from forming those crosslinks. And we said that that was a, uh, the bacteria use these D-amino acids to avoid uh, their, their cell wall precursor getting chopped up by regular protease enzymes in the body. Uh, and this exquisite structure of vancomycin is designed to allow these five hydrogen bonds uh, to that uh, cell wall precursor to be formed, okay, to form this very tight complex uh, to prevent uh, the cross-linking action. Uh, but then we also learned that because uh, bacteria are smarter than humans, uh, they're able to evolve uh, to beat uh, antibiotics that we have, uh, and all the bacteria have to do is switch this uh, NH for an oxygen, and exchange this amide bond for an ester bond, uh, and now uh, vancomycin binds uh, about a thousand times weaker uh, to this species than it does to that one because you've, you've lost one hydrogen bond and you've replaced it with an electrostatic repulsive interaction between these two oxygens, okay? So one of my favorite peptides, Ben. That is a very good question. Uh, peptides are not as common as small molecules, just our standard organic molecules. Uh, 
uh, or antibodies, antibodies, uh, which are proteins. Uh, peptides kind of occupy a medium-sized space between smaller organic molecules and, and, and the proteins, which are usually antibodies. Um, they have great potential as drugs because you have almost limitless design possibilities due to all the natural as well as unnatural amino acids that you can link together. But the number one problem is this uh, proteolytic cleavage that we've talked about. Uh, and so there's a lot of effort being expended to design peptides and make them more stable to the, the cleavage by proteolysis, including work in my own lab. That's one of the things that we're trying to do uh, with peptides is render them more stable to proteolysis. So yes, there are peptide drugs on the market. Uh, their market share is increasing. In order for it to increase even more, we have to get better at stabilizing peptides to proteolysis. Also, enabling them to be uh, to cross cell membranes. Usually they're too polar to cross cell membranes. And so uh, there, there are some issues with physical properties as well. But that's an that's a, 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 a area of modern um, research, uh, making peptides uh, more suitable as drugs. Yes, Claire. Just in this particular case. So, so it's relatively common for either cyclic or acyclic peptides to have uh, an amide at the C terminus, uh, but it's not always the case. It, it may or may not be the case. If we look at vancomycin, vancomycin has three rings in it and it does have a free carboxylic acid at its C terminus. Okay, yes, Jack. Not necessarily. Um, they're usually, the cyclic peptides usually have rings that are greater than 12 because there's, uh, when you're between like 7 and 12, there's a lot of strain. And once you get above 12, you have less strain. So I'd say typically more than 12, but uh, not, not an exact uh, ring size. All right, so a lot, of, a lot of interesting peptides, a lot of great research going on in peptides. We're actually going to skip the section in the book on peptide sequencing because that is outdated. Uh, mass spectrometry is typically used to sequence peptides these days. So some of the reactions that were previously used for peptide synthesis sequencing are interesting. You're welcome to read them and learn about those mechanisms if you want, but we're not going to uh, cover that uh, uh, in class. Instead, we're going to move into peptide synthesis, how peptides are synthesized. Okay? Uh, I alluded to the fact that the previous slide I showed you was an oversimplification. To stimulate some discussion here, let's have an eye clicker question. If you had two amino acids, alanine and phenylalanine, and you just reacted those amino acids and wanted to form dipeptides, how many would you form? How many different dipeptides would you form? All right, let's uh, try to get our final answers in in the next uh, 10 or 15 seconds. Final answers. Any more answers today? Okay, that looks like all. All right, how many different dipeptides? Four, okay. Who would like to raise their hand and tell us which four would form? Okay, Joseph? 
Okay, so you could get homodimers of each one, right? The, the N, the amine of one alanine could react with the carboxylate of another alanine, and same with phenylalanine. Okay, keep going. Yeah, we learned previously at the beginning of class that when you have a mixed dipeptide between two different amino acids, there's two constitutional isomers. We could have the alanine at the N terminus and the phenylalanine at the C terminus or reverse. So there's a total of four different dipeptides that you would get if you tried to form a peptide from alanine and phenylalanine. And you can't just mix the two together. What reagent do you need to form an amide bond? Think back to chapter 22. It's DCC, okay? So you would use DCC to mix these uh, uh, amino acids together to make amides. Usually we don't want four dipeptides. Usually we want a single dipeptide. The only way to get a single dipeptide from two different amino acids is to protect the functional groups that we don't want to react with each other. So let's take a look at how we would do that generally, and then we'll talk about some specific protecting groups. So here, the assignment is to make alanine glycine, okay? So if we want to synthesize alanine glycine, we want the carboxylate of alanine to react with the amine of glycine. In order to control the reaction, so that's the only uh, one that occurs, we have to protect the amine of alanine, and we have to protect the carboxylic acid of glycine. So we have a four-step process we have to go through to make a single dipeptide. The first two steps involve those protection installing those protecting groups, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about specific protecting groups in a moment, but for now we're just abbreviating them as PG because we're just going over the, the general strategy, okay? So once we have accomplished those two protecting steps, now we can react the protected amino acids with DCC, and now we've gotten it to a point where there's only one dipeptide that would be formed. Okay, there's no ability for these uh, individual amino acids to react with themselves because they each only have one unprotected functional group. And there's only one mixed dipeptide that you can form. Uh, and that's going to be using uh, the carboxylic acid of our alanine and the amine of our glycine. Okay. Uh, and then our final step is to remove the protecting groups. In some cases, we want to remove just one of the protecting groups and we want to leave the other one intact. We'll talk about that a little more on Wednesday, uh, whereas in other cases, uh, we would want to remove both of those protecting groups, okay? So this is the general strategy, a reminder of the structure of DCC. If you don't remember the mechanism by which DCC forms amides, it's a neat mechanism. I think we might have had it on an exam, actually, so you can just look back on exam two, uh, and, and you'll see that, uh, that mechanism. So uh, let's talk about the specific protecting groups that are used. So for amines, uh, the most common protecting groups are a class of uh, functional groups called carbamates. So a carbamate looks like this. It looks like half ester, half amide. It's actually one oxidation state higher than the ester or the amide. It's at the CO2 oxidation state because we have four bonds between our carbonyl carbon and heteroatoms. <clears throat> so the advantage of using carbamates versus amides, because we learned earlier in class that you could use amides to protect amines, and you can. Carbamates are better because they are easier to deprotect. They can be deprotected under very specific conditions that cleave the carbamate and not other functional groups uh, in the molecule. Right? You couldn't use an amide in peptide, group, uh, peptide synthesis because if you wanted to cleave an amide protecting group, you would also end up cleaving the amide bond you just worked so hard to synthesize. Right? That's not going to work. So you have to have something other than an amide to protect the amines in peptide synthesis. So we're going to go into a little more detail than the book does on this topic. Uh, we're going to teach you three amide protecting groups uh, or three, three uh, nitrogen protecting groups, which are carbamates, as opposed to the two uh, that the book teaches you. Uh, the first one we will teach you uh, is called the Bach group. 
which is stands for tert butoxy carbonyl. I mean, that's a long word. We like to abbreviate long words in organic chemistry, so we call this the Bach group. As the name suggests, there's a tert butyl group uh, in a Bach group. The way you install a Bach group is you use a reagent called ditert butyl dicarbonate. Okay, also a big long name. Okay, this is called ditert butyl dicarbonate. We abbreviate it as BOC2O. Okay, when we see BOC or Bach, that refers to this part. Okay, you can see we have two of those linked by an oxygen. Okay, so we call that BOC2O. Okay, so a dicarbonate looks like an anhydride, but it has extra oxygens. If it were an anhydride, these would not be oxygens. Uh, but it behaves like an anhydride, uh, meaning that it will react with an amine. But notice if we try to react it with an amino acid, we're going to have a zwitter ion. Okay. Uh, and the ammonium group of a zwitter ion is not nucleophilic. And so we need a base to deprotonate that uh, to make it nucleophilic. And the base that is used uh, to install a Bach group is typically triethylamine. That's going to deprotonate that nitrogen. It's also going to facilitate any other proton transfers uh, that we need uh, in the mechanism. Uh, but then this is just going to be a nucleophilic acyl substitution once we deprotonate that nitrogen. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we're going to end up with a Bach protected amino acid. Okay. It's going to look like this. So we're not going to draw the mechanism uh, because it's just a nucleophilic acyl substitution process. Uh, many times, instead of drawing out the Bach group, uh, we would just write it like that. We would write Bach, NH, R, and then our carboxylate group there. Okay. Any questions about installing Bach groups? Okay, now we're going to talk about the deprotection, uh, which has a, a really interesting mechanism uh, and is really, really cool. So carbamates are valuable as amine protecting groups because when you cleave them off, you generate CO2. And that's going to be highly thermodynamically favorable. CO2 is a very stable molecule. It is a gas. So... Uh, uh, it's going to bubble out of the reaction mixture. It'll make the cleavage of the carbamate irreversible. Uh, so that's why carbamates are very useful as uh, protecting groups. So what happens? How do we cleave a Bach carbamate? Let's raise this up a little bit. Whoops. We wanted to go, not that one. There we go. So we're going to use strong acids. Uh, HCl or trifluoroacetic acid, or HBr, are the strong acids that are going to work the best for cleaving. Okay, Trifluoroacetic acid is almost as strong as HCl. It's a little bit weaker acid, uh, abbreviated as TFA. Very good for cleaving Bach groups. All right, I think we'll need more space than we have left on that board to draw the mechanism. So let's take a look at the mechanism of cleaving a Bach group. Okay. So we're just going to write R for the rest of the amino acid here uh, that is protected. We'll go ahead and draw this out here for you. Okay. So what's going to happen as we react this Bach protected amino acid with HCl? We'll protonate the carbamate. Which atom of the carbamate will we protonate? The oxygen. Just like an amide, we're going to protonate the oxygen as opposed to the nitrogen. That's going to give us a resonance-stabilized species. We generate chloride in the process. 
Okay, so now we have our conjugate acid. Now, because we have a tert butyl group here, and that tert butyl group would form a reasonably stable tertiary carbocation, that tert butyl group can just fall off, okay, giving you a tert butyl cation, and giving you a new species known as a carbamic acid, okay? All right, so we get this neutral species, we get our tert butyl cation. We have two products here of this step. They both have an individual fate. We'll show you what happens to the tert butyl cation first. Remember, we generated chloride in our first step. So chloride is just going to deprotonate one of the hydrogens of our tert butyl cation, and that's going to give us this is isobutylene or uh, two methylpropene, that's a gas. Uh, and you'll notice that we just reformed HCl uh, in the process. So technically this would be catalytic in HCl, but usually we use stoichiometric amounts to have a fast rate. Now this carbamic acid is crying out to lose CO2 because that's a very, very stable molecule. And so what happens is this nitrogen can, can take that proton You'll notice that's going to give us a four-membered cyclic transition state, which usually is strained or unfavorable. But we can have those kinds of transition states if there is uh, uh, something favorable coupled to it, which in this case is the generation of CO2. Okay? So we have pairs of electrons moving in the fashion I've shown you. That gives us our amine and CO2. Okay. Any questions on how we cleave a Bach group from a Bach carbamate from an amine? Okay, good. So this uh, protecting group is used to, uh, or is cleaved under acidic conditions. Um, sometimes we want a protecting group that can be cleaved under basic conditions. Okay, so there we would use the nine fluorinyl methoxy carbonyl group. And that's known as FMOC. We're never going to say this name again. It's way too long. We're just going to call it the FMOC group. Okay? So the FMOC group is complementary to the Bach group because it is a base labile carbamate. Okay? So the structure is even bigger than the name. It has two benzene rings with a five-membered ring in between. And then we have this um, CH2 and this oxygen coming off. This is the reagent that is used to make an FMOC group. It's called FMOC chloroformate, okay? It's like an acid chloride and an ester glued together. But we're going to react that with our amino acid. We're going to use sodium carbonate. We're going to use water as a solvent for this reaction. Uh, sodium carbonate is a base. Uh, I'm not going to draw that FMOC thing again. I'm just going to write, uh, write it like this. Okay, so this is a nucleophilic acyl substitution, much like the one we showed for uh, making a Bach group up here. We're going to deprotonate our amine with sodium carbonate first. It's going to attack this carbonyl, displace the chloride to give the FMOC group. Okay, uh, but the key thing with FMOC, the neat thing is how the FMOC group is deprotected. So we're going to draw that over here for you. It is deprotected with base. And it's actually deprotected with a relatively weak base, uh, papyridine, which is a six-membered cyclic amine, is the base that is most commonly used to deprotect the FMOC group. Okay. So let's make sure I draw this correctly. 
So here's our FMOC protected amino acid. Here's our papyridine. This is a weak base. What this papyridine is going to do is deprotonate this hydrogen. Okay. Now ask yourselves, why on earth would a weak base deprotonate a hydrogen from a carbon? As I draw the product here, the conjugate base that is generated, please think about why this happens, because then I'll ask you the question as soon as I'm done drawing it. Okay. So we get a carbanion here. How can we form that carbanion from a weak base? Has anybody come up with it yet, Sam? Excellent. This is an aromatic conjugate base. How many pi electrons? OK. If you look at the whole thing, it would be 14. You were just looking at the five-membered ring, and that's correct. But you can also look at the whole system here, and it has 14 pi electrons. OK, so that's aromatic. Uh, so having an aromatic conjugate base greatly stabilizes it and allows us to generate it using a weak base. Obviously, the chemists who designed this molecule knew that. OK, so once we get to this stage, carbamates really want to lose CO2. We can have an elimination. This is an E1CB process. Uh, we're eliminating from the conjugate base. We're generating this molecule. Okay, this highly conjugated molecule. We're releasing CO2. Uh, we're generating a fairly basic nitrogen anion. But then we have the conjugate acid of our piperidine that's simply going to protonate that. Okay. And that gives you your deprotected amine and regenerates piperidine. Okay. So, whoops. So whereas a Bach group is stable to base and cleaved with acid, an f mock group is stable to acid and cleaved with base. So these are complementary protecting groups. At the beginning of class on Wednesday, we'll teach you a third protecting group for amines, and then we'll jump into uh, carboxylate uh, protecting groups. Okay? Make sure you work on that synthesis assignment.